Welcome to Evolve to Succeed, the podcast that brings together entrepreneurs, founders, business leaders and experts to talk about their journeys and explore the link between personal and business success. I'm your host, Juan Munson, founder of Evolve, a coaching, training and development company focused on enabling business and personal success and creating a community of like-minded individuals. Whether that be through our peer groups, one-to-one coaching, our training and development programs for you and your teams, or through our content and events, our mission is to get the best out of each individual and inspire them to be better both in life and in business. If you want to learn more about Evolve, including our beautiful co-working space in Ashley Cross in Paul, then please go to evolvemembers.com where you'll find great content, insights, details of all of our services, and also information on our forthcoming events. For now though, let's get on with the show. Welcome to this week's episode. Today we're here from Adam Walker, a founder of a number of businesses in the leisure and property sector, and most recently co-founder of Foundry, a flexible working space business aimed at empowering local businesses with sites in Eastbourne, Poole, and soon to be launched in Walthamstow. Adam is a natural entrepreneur, having co-founded a highly successful coin-operated and gaming machine supply company with his uncle, just aged 19. Following that, Adam turned his eye to property development and has remained in that game ever since, creating some unique spaces in unique ways, as you'll hear during the course of our conversation. Among other topics on the show, Adam talks about managing hypergrowth inside a business, the important personal and business lessons he learned from his unexpected passing of his uncle, his experience of having grown and exited a business at a relatively young age of 33, and his passion for regeneration and the use of space. Please do enjoy this episode. Adam, welcome to the Evolve to Succeed podcast. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks so much for inviting me on. Yeah, it's going to be great to have you as a guest. We're going to be talking about your own entrepreneurial journey, some of the lessons you've learned along the way yourself, some of the things that have impacted you, but also going to be talking uh, about the foundry, uh, the new business that you've created in recent years and what's next for that and what's next for that kind of uh, property type style of business. So lots for us to cover, but we should start the discussion, the conversation, Adam, with the fact that in 1999, when just age 19, you co-founded a gaming uh, business. So let's explore that a bit more detail. I suppose I should start with that question. Why, what led you to starting your own business at just age 19? Wow, that's a good one. It's great to be here and evolve as well. I really appreciate you inviting me over to the BT. Um, Well, we'd have to roll right back. Um, My... Actually, to my grandparents, my my mum's dad was a market trader in Bristol at the old Eastfield Market, which is now the IKEA in okay. Bristol. Yeah, we've all uh, driven by. That yeah, yet. and um, yeah, and and he was a he was very well known, Fred Smith. He was a real character on that market. Um, and my father's dad was a paratrooper, come publican, okay. and scouser. So Birkenhead um, ran Birkenhead Social Club and was then asked by Courage Brewery uh, to move down to Bristol with my dad and all his brothers and, and sister, loads of them. So they relocated from Birkenhead to Bristol in the late 70s. And my granddad, Jack, my dad's dad, had what I would describe best probably as, as Bristol super pubs at the okay. time. So they were, they were rough and ready, proper blue-collar pubs in, all over Bristol. And... Um, I grew up in that environment. I grew up okay. in that in that pub scene. Yeah. Um, and uh, it, it was a real eye-opener for me. And that really led me roll forward a few years into my father starting his own business. Okay. My father was in the construction industry. He had a decent-sized business. It was a concrete format business. So he would build hotels and car parks and big concrete structures. And I, I, went, I left school, based in Bristol at this time, I left school at 15, went out on site and picked up a trade as a shuttering yeah. carpenter. Tough business. Yeah. Did a few winters <laughs> and thought, this is really, really tough. What am I doing? And um, one January morning, I remember leaving my house and uh, my parents' house. And I was 
jumping in, in in my pickup truck, about 17, 18 years old. And my dad's brother, my uncle Kevin, big Kevin, um, big Kev, uh, he said to me, what are you doing? You think he was jumping in his Chrysler Grand Voyager at the time. <laughs> and uh, this is, you know, 98, something like that. What are you doing? You should, you know, when you have a chat with me, well, I've got this new product that, that we're starting to import from the States. And uh, so that night I came back. Uncle Kev was there at home. He said, what are you doing tonight? I said, oh, fancy a beer? I said, yeah, let's go. And we went to Dave & Buster's. If you can remember, Dave & Buster's were an American amusement brand that yeah. came over. Didn't really work out that well for them. Um, but we wrote the business plan for our business together on a napkin in Dave & Buster's in Bristol that night. And it consisted of scaling quickly yeah. into pubs and clubs with touchscreen gaming machines. Mm -hmm. So this was 1998. Okay. Um, and that was the explosion of well, the Crystal Maze. So these were the quiz machines that we all probably do remember from that time. Yeah. These are the quiz machines. These yeah. were touchscreen quiz machines. And so it was Crystal Maze. Um, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? was yeah. just coming into the market. And a product from America called uh, the Megatouch. And before we knew it, we had a lot of these mm machines across the southwest and across london so m4 m5 corridor right so at sort of 1920 i woke up with pretty sizable gaming machine operation um and that, that we co-founded together and very very young i became at that time the youngest holder of a gaming board license so now the gambling commission um so started to grow the business into um essentially for the fruit machine business. So indoor games grew substantially down the M4, down the M5 corridor. We went from Soho to Land's End, wow. basically. And be between me and my uncle Kevin, Big Kev, we, we grew this business together um, in my early 20s. And what did it feel like to be growing a business at that, such a young age? When you look back on you know, those times now, you know, what are the key feelings that you can remember? <clears throat> I think my my upbringing in the pub game with my granddad really helped because I saw I saw firsthand what it was like and how you talk to people. Yeah. The education I got from that was was critical, and that allowed, that allowed me really to scale this business quickly. Yeah. Not just because the relationships that we had, we had lots of obviously family relationships and friends in the industry, which allowed me to to break in. Yeah. Um, and so that only goes so far, doesn't it? You can only lean on those relationships and there's only so much growth you can get out of that to get the kind of momentum. But then, uh, then you're out into the big wide world, aren't you? T totally. And you're dealing with breweries. And, and yeah. at that time, you had um, massive um, uh, multi-chain um, breweries, Enterprise Inn, Punch Taverns back then. This was, it was that era. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was, a, it was an interesting journey for me. And we grew it really quickly. It was super, super entrepreneurial. And it did. It, it completely consumed me. I, mean, I still see a lot of my old schoolmates, and you know that era of my life was gone. That was yeah. that was me founding a business, and it was my absolute um, sole focus was yeah. to grow that business. So it was, it was a, it, it was a, it was an intense period of time of my life for sure. And do you think there was a distinct advantage that you? Because there's kind of a lot of speak about this, you know, should people just get on, get out there, start their first business, get going or do they go get a career, do they go get experience? And there's probably pros and cons for both. But do you look back now and, and just think, you know, thank God I did it when I did? I think when you're young, you're 18, 19, without the commitments perhaps that we yeah, all... No responsibility. Yeah, so. I think, I think that, that certainly helped me... Um, uh, grow the business quick quicker yeah um and it enabled me to to be more focused perhaps although saying that i think i'm working harder now than i've ever worked um <laughs> Life doesn't at, get easier, at 42 um but um yeah i think f for me the, the, the when i look back at that period of time i mean i can remember it was just me and i can remember in the early days a sack barrow truck me and my pickup truck and a who wants to be a millionaire quiz machine every night and I wouldn't stop until I put that machine into a pub yeah. somewhere in the southwest of England and it went on and on and on for years like that where I would go in meet the landlord do a deal yeah. shake hands sign you know some piece of paper 
Yeah, some form of contract. <laughs> to say that he'd received a £3,000 machine from me and hopefully it'd still be there in two weeks when I came back to empty the cash box. Um, so yeah, it was a, it, it was a real uh, eye-opening and um, it was a great experience because it taught me how to talk to people. It yeah. taught me how to, um, to do deals uh, and, it, and it taught me everything I needed to know at that stage about scaling yeah and um the basics of running the a business of that scaling like you say you just mentioned like collecting cash and you know how do you run multi-site kind of operations i mean there was a lot to learn very quickly just about logistics operations and business in general wasn't it i learned very quickly about employment <laughs> and how tricky that is and staff and the right team and yeah at such a young age and i was i was trying to grow this business yeah. very very quickly um and yeah, it, it was an eye opener. I had I had some some harsh lessons early, lessons early on. Yeah. Um, I think I think that that they were really useful looking back. Yeah. Um, about sort of hyper growth and yeah. control control of, of of growth. Um, and trust delegation. Hmm. I learned to become a a pretty good delegator. I seem to have lost that skill at the moment. Okay. Um, hopefully get, <laughs> we'll hopefully touch that, on that a bit later in our conversation. Hopefully that comes back to me. Um, but um, yeah, delegation and, and I guess prioritizing yeah. um, and, and, and processing information and being able, being able to being able to scale a business at that pace. It was it was it was a really really eye opening experience yeah, for me. Definitely, not very few actually can do it and can achieve it. So good on you. And I suppose at the time you you know. You had um, your uncle with you, you know, you obviously co-founded the business with him. He was there as a kind of guiding arm by the sounds of it. But, you know, I read and I hope you don't mind me touching on this, Adam, that in 2004 you lost your uncle. And so what impact did that have on you and have on the business? Yeah, it was it was a shock. It was a it was sudden. Um, He was a. Kevin was uh, Kevin Walker. Um, he had a business called Kevin's Cloth Emporium (KCE). So his main business was pool and snooker. Okay. Everybody knew him in the industry. You 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 never forget Kevin if you met him once. Uh, he was loved in that scene and that world of snooker pool. Um, he was British champion table football player. Okay. You know, be on the telly, be off in. Uh, He'd be off in Mauritius with Barry Hearn at the Bar- at the uh, Marlin World Cup every year, and yeah. and uh, and you know he was he was a he was a great character. He lived, a f- he'd, he passed away at forty seven, but he lived he lived the life of of ten men. He he really did. And wow. um, but um, yeah, it, it was it was a difficult time for us because he had three kids, yeah, um, three young kids. Um, so it was a it was a real shock for us all. Um, and his business needed to be run, needed to be continued. Um, I remember when it happened and I immediately got in my car and drove to London. He was based in West London. And um, before I knew it, I was going to China to visit the factories because we had, he'd, he'd be constantly buying containers of, of product from China. And before I knew it, I was in China, sat in front of factory owners. At, I was 23 years old. Yeah. And we're talking about three, $400,000 worth of debt. Um, because you know Kev, Kev was a really good guy. Everybody loved him. They gave yeah. him credit. He had a fantastic business. Um, he was a real innovator in that world. So, yeah, it was a it was a tough time. It was it was difficult. But again, um, I guess that taught me about resilience. Mm-hmm. It taught me about when you build a business, you need to build in resilience. You need yeah. to understand that key man. If things do go wrong and people, yeah. you know, things like this do happen. Yeah. So. Big lesson for us. Um, Kev, never far from my mind, from my thoughts every day. Makes me laugh every day. I always think about some of the stuff that we did together. And because of him and, and what his opportunity, the opportunity that he gave, that he gave to me, uh, I will be forever grateful. Yeah, great. Well, sounds like Kevin was a remarkable man, Adam. He was a good and guy. Well, you know, grateful to that you had in your, in your life. And yeah, well, obviously has had a very influential impact on who you are and what you are and the direction of travel that you then took so rolling forward then you know just has it been you know where i suppose are you still involved in that gaming business is it still part of your life now you know what journey have you been on with it adam yeah i mean that that business is still very much in operation i exited when i was 33 um 
Uh, it was a geography thing, really. I, I was um, very fortunate. That business really took off during the period of BlackBerry. Yeah. Um, so we could, we could run that business from wherever. It became a, become a remotely operated business. And I was very fortunate in my 20s to be able to travel, as I touched on there, China. Yeah. I was in China two or three times a year. I was in Vegas for um, gaming conventions and... Yeah. and, and um, Somewhere that I loved, particularly uh, the, the, the Caribbean islands. I spent a lot of my time in the Caribbean islands, exploring the islands in my 20s. I was very fortunate. And that business gave me that lifestyle. Yeah. Um, whilst I was doing that, I was getting involved in property investment development. Okay. Small scale. So you're taking some of the profits, some of the earnings from, the, from it and getting into kind of creating our own portfolio? Yeah, I could see, I could see that. I could see the challenges that were coming with, at that time, we touched on it earlier, Punch Taverns, Enterprise Inns, the big pub co's were taking on uh, an awful lot of, of uh, the, the portfolios were growing exponentially, and beer tax, smoking ban, 2007, my 27th birthday, 2007, the smoking ban came in, mm. and... I think we all realized at that point we were we were going to have to pivot the business quite quickly. Yeah. Um, so you can imagine pubs all overnight became completely different environments, clubs, yeah. social clubs, etc. Remember the change taking place, yeah. And whilst it was great because you didn't stink yeah. <laughs> when you got home at night, you had all sorts of other issues when you went yeah. into a pub. Um, so it was it, it was a it was a moment in time for us and and for me I thought okay, we need to start thinking about the direction of travel for this business. Mm-hmm. We could see that digital was coming in. We could see the, 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 the iPad, the iPhone was, was just coming in at that stage, 2004, 2005. Yeah. At 2007, you could see that gaming was starting to go, come from analog to digital. Remote gaming was taking over. So yeah, I think, I think at that point, I was starting to think about my exit. Yeah. Um, and then, then we had... We had a couple of more years doing that, um, which was which was just figuring out, monitoring pub closures, monitoring the direction of, of travel for that industry and yeah. working really closely with all the trade bodies and the gambling commission to understand where pubs, clubs, yeah. casinos that were going. And then, uh, yeah, in my 30s, early 30s, I made the decision then to, to, to start carving the business up. Um, yeah. And the the business that I founded in Bristol is still operating, okay. still run by the same management team that I started it with. Wow! Uh, and they are really lovely people, and they're still still doing a great job with that yeah. business. It's a much smaller business now um, because that's down to the amount of pubs and clubs that there are now. Yeah. Um, but I still go back, I still see them, and I still pop in and see some of my old customers and who've known me since I was a little boy. Yeah, um, <laughs> through that journey because of the family, not yeah. just from starting the business. So what did it? You know, like we all, as you know, business owners, entrepreneurs, founders, whatever you want to badge us as, you know, generally, you know, grow a business to try and optimize what the exit may look like, and that might be quite a lifestyle business. It might be handed to the next generation. It might be kind of exit, exit. But for most people, in truth, that happens usually at the earliest point is sort of maybe mid to late forties, but into the fifties, even into the sixties. For you, you'd kind of grown significant business. And exited it at age thirty-three. Yeah. Uh, how did that? How did you feel? Because I'd imagine there's a little bit of emptiness, maybe. Correct. Yeah, I think it started before then. Okay. I think one of my a, a, a great lesson for me, and I always try and take this forward with me, is that know when, know when you are no longer under, be able to identify when you are no longer adding value mm. as a founder. Um, as a CEO, whatever yeah. you want to call yourself, managing director, as a leader. And I could see that, that at a point in time in that business, I was probably no longer adding value. And the business needed to either grow very, very quickly yeah. or potentially contract because of the nature of, the, of yeah. that landscape in that world. And I think that's what made the decision for me. It was a difficult time because um, it was my baby. I, yeah. you know, I just, formed that business when I was 18 years old. It's all old. you'd ever known really in adult life, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. And I knew that it'd give me a really, really good lifestyle. Um, so, yeah, it was it was a difficult year, actually. It was a difficult year. And I think that was the first time in my early 30s that I probably experienced that feeling of what's next. Yeah. Um, 
but very quickly found out what was next. Okay, um, it didn't take long. Then. Didn't take not long at all. Yeah, I mean, I was I was quite fortunate that that um, you know I had a very supportive family and 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 we were you know we were in a relatively good place at that time. So I find myself in East London, out on the Essex borders at this time, living with um, living with my my wife and my, our son and my little boy, and um, and we. Um, my wife will say, oh, you, you know, you, 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 you're such a gym flirt. You go from gym to gym to gym, you've got different memberships everywhere. Anyway, I was, I joined this gym in, in Loughton and, uh, Chigwell, sorry. And, um, met these great guys, these, uh, these, uh, guys that were investing locally. Um, and they had a concept for, uh, to buy a building. And I'm like 33 at this yeah. time, 32, 33 at this time. I was just exiting. And the concept was to take a 50,000 square foot building um, in a really good position right outside the Central Line stop uh, in, in East London and turn it into a mixed-use development and also okay. create a HQ for their business. Okay. So interesting I thought, proposition. This is interesting. Yeah. I, could, I could enjoy this. This is something I could really get into and something that I understand a little bit about. Um, so we did, we schemed this project up together myself and, and the investors from Grangewood and uh, two brothers Richard and Mike Stevens lovely guys and um, we we did it we did it we got we got the funding together and we did it and we built wow. this fantastic building which is still there and runs at a very high occupancy if not 100% occupancy right. year round um, we did that one together and very quickly we filled it up we curated it um, filled it up with really interesting complementary businesses from all different sectors all different life stages and yeah. I thought this is really interesting we've created something, something that we've created a physical platform in this very digital world that we find ourselves in where people are buying from each other and it was quite it was quite you know I wouldn't say it was a we work but it yeah. was it was that era when yeah 2013 2014 when we were were really exploding into the market of flex and I could see that there was this this demand for flex, flexible space. I'm not yeah. saying flex working or co-working at the time, yeah. but, but flexible, flexible space, flexible terms, flexible space, and the community. Yeah. So we started to think, okay, how can we do this? How can we scale this in the suburbs? Okay. Not really interested in central. Yeah. Brilliant operators in Central. Yeah, the big boys are all there. Yeah. They're doing their thing. Can't you know, add. The investment need must be huge in Central London can't really add much to that yeah can you really go there with purpose and, and create the impact that you can create out in the suburbs probably not no so I started looking at the suburbs we identified another site opposite where we just finished the the um multi-let conversion and that's where we had the idea for crate and okay. crate was really born out of looking at what Roger Wade did with Box Park, which was the first ever pop-up yeah. mall in Shoreditch, which is a fantastic co concept and will always be... Um, I mean, what an innovator to have thought uh, of that and you know, done what he did. Yeah. Massively admirable of Roger and what he's done with Box Park. It's a fantastic brand. Um, and so we saw what, what Roger done with Box Park there. I had an eye on what WeWork were doing, what Adam was doing at WeWork, and we thought, okay, maybe we could sort of blend the two. Maybe we could create some creative workspace um, within out in the suburbs, and we did it out in Loughton. So we used um, we used containers to build it because it was only by a chance the site was actually um, contaminated. So okay. we couldn't go into the ground; it would have been too costly. So we used a modular build. Yeah. So we used a container build to build it, and that's really where the idea for crate came from. Um, and it was box part meets we work. That's okay. the way some people describe kind of the it. Way to, yeah. Easiest way to describe it. And I used to get a lot of stick because we put a we put a costa first ever at the time Whitbread Costa um, in a shipping container on the entrance so you had to drive under this red bridge this Costa bridge okay. to go into Crate in Loughton and it was it's brilliant and it's, yeah. it's, it's coming up to six years old this year um, and it still uh, is very well occupied it's curated it looks great and it has this Costa on the front, and I get a lot of stick for that because I talk passionately about entrepreneurship. Yeah, and independent businesses and all of and, those kinds of things. Yeah, and I always get it. I remember, <laughs> I remember at Mippin, I was doing this talk at Mippin, which is a, a property show in, in the south of France, and um, doing this talk, and you know, I knew it was going to come. Yeah, you talk about entrepreneurship, and you've got a Costa on the front. 
Costa is a really interesting business model because Costa is effectively a franchise business yeah. model. And at that time, that franchisee was a local lad. He was 35 and he was on his 32nd Costa. 32nd? Yeah, he's now on over 100 Costas. Wow. So this young lad, this franchisee, for me, is the ultimate aspirational entrepreneur. Yeah. The other end of the scale, you've got a startup who's got a small business idea that wants, that wants to come in and you've got an aspirational entrepreneur at the other. So you've got two different life stages, yeah. totally different sectors. If you can curate a platform that you can put these businesses into, these entrepreneurs, these nomads, these creatives, these franchisees, you can get them all into one place. And that was really what Crate was about. The physical platform of Crate was irrelevant. The yeah. fact that it was in shipping containers or whatever. Um, that then became... The heart of the business was something completely different. And it, it was all about that. And I started to think, well, this is really interesting. You know, I could scale this. We could... We could probably roll this out. It wasn't about shipping containers. No. It just so happened that this site was contaminated. Yeah. And we couldn't, you know, we needed something light touch, so to speak. So there we were, and we filled that up really quickly. We curated it. So we were very clear on what our mission was and what we wanted to do and what, what, the, uh, what, the, what the commercials yeah. were as well. It was commercially challenging. Like all, all, a lot of these projects, they're difficult. You have to do it at scale to make it work. So we did that. And... Um, then I exited that business because I wanted to scale okay. and the team, we couldn't scale as a team because yeah. it would have required, again, a different management team, investment. Yeah. It just wasn't going to work out. So you just realized that the time was done in that business. I mean, that takes some self-awareness and confidence to do that, Adam. Most people sort of, you know, hanging a bit too long, don't they? They becomes maybe a bit fractious and yeah, and everybody gets a bit dis contented I suppose that that you know, that sums it up well and I think that you know I think when you look back with hindsight now you realize that I guess you've got investors that are patient capital investors yeah. and they're much older than me and they've got a really nice rent roll now yeah and for those guys to go to the next step huge risk yeah not in their risk profile no so I think you know you've got to look back and you think you know Brilliant. That was a that was a great stepping stone yeah. for me, and those guys have ended up with some fantastic assets. Yeah. So, for me, the outcome was was great, and for them, I think the outcome was great too. Brilliant. So, ne next step was new management team, scale yeah. crate. Okay. That was the next step, and again, that was a that was a, a funny moment of, wow, here we go. Okay. Now we need to roll this out. We've got a, we've got a model. We've got a proof of concept. Yeah. We've got a brand. We've got a management team that's got the skill sets to do it need some investment so we started talking to private equity yeah. started talking to institutions and then imagine that that time PE was all over the flex working co-working whatever you want to call it reutilization of space market weren't completely there? this is um 2018 2000 yeah. late 2017 2018 so um yeah pre the we crashed yeah i was gonna uh, say the problem soon yeah, burst in yeah, the way in which yeah, pre all of, looked all of that market. there was it was a big influx of cash into the business yeah. into the sector so we started thinking we started to identify lots of opportunities all over the country clearly spread way too thin very quickly yeah uh, as a management team um and then we start we identified our second crate scheme so we built we built the second crate scheme in Walthamstow in North East London. Okay. Uh, it's called Crates and James Street. Fantastic. It's a food and beverage led scheme uh, with some workspace in it and service amenity retail. So destination with a little D, I okay. would say. Yeah. Um, makers, creators, service industry businesses. Um, and that that that's a, a successful scheme. It's there still today. It opened in twenty nineteen. That was a five year meanwhile use project. Okay. Um, that will be there for a few more years, I would imagine, as all the residential pops up around it. Yeah. And during that during that phase of my um, journey, I suppose really, it's when I started to think about the context of the curation. The important bit here is not the physical piece. The physical piece being the container piece as crate. It was all about yeah. the curation, You've the mix. You've used that word a lot, haven't you, yeah. that curation. To you, that must be, that's the linchpin of everything you're doing, is it? It is, it's really important. We don't lose sight of that. So we, we are creating and curating these these, these yeah. spaces. So we, we create a physical platform, yeah. whatever that looks like. But most importantly, we are curating that mix. Yeah that community, 
that cross sector, cross life stage, cross life stage piece that we spoke about. So here we are again, another crate scheme down. Yeah, and now I'm in discussions with um, investors. Okay, and we're talking to some fantastic investors, and I'm thinking about my next step. Do I scale with crate, or do I take some investment and grow yeah. this? vision for curated environments so here we go again okay so, so adam now steps into pivot again pivot again we're coming Not away pivot this time maybe <laughs> i think it was a it was a sidestep yeah it was a sidestep it was it and, and it was a it was another moment where i realized that actually as a founder the founder of crate i was probably not adding that much value anymore yeah because we weren't going to be able to scale quick enough okay. at that time. Pandemic was just hitting. Okay, right. So 2020. Yeah. Um, that was, a, a again, another moment where we all, we all had to take a step back, obviously, and reassess. And conversation was, was happening with an investment vehicle called Legal in General. Yeah. Investment business called Legal in General. Real Assets, which is the real estate portfolio or the investment management business that manages the real estate portfolio of legal okay. in general and really really interesting that the team there are an incredibly talented bunch of of individuals that run this amazing business mm. um and the guys had called me up and said would you pop down to eastbourne okay will you pop down to pool so they kind of heard of you you're, you're out there raising investment they were but they had some assets they needed to repurpose type we had a relationship yeah, yeah. and um there was a there was a, a a moment happening uh where clearly retail high streets shopping centers yeah. retail as we know it the sector was having a very difficult yeah. time pre-pandemic obviously yeah. And I could see that. And I was very interested, as I said, as I touched on before, in less about the physical modular thing, about how we can curate these spaces and how if we could effectively plug into former department stores, yeah. um, high street locations, okay. and started to think about, it's quite challenging, yeah, you know, these spaces are challenging. They're generally very dark. Yeah, they're very dark. It's not not natural light. Deep, is that, that, yeah. yeah, and so they've got lots of challenges with them. How how could we possibly bring this product into into the high street? And that's when the conversation really started to get going with with uh, with with legal and general real assets. Uh, went down to pool, looked at the dolphin, which is where we are today. We're yeah. sat in we're sat in pool in, in the Bermuda Triangle. Yeah, um, and. That really triggered something for me. I started to think this is this is really interesting. There are lots of shopping centres with lots of challenges yeah. um, that have to start repurposing, reimagining, and um, coming away perhaps than from from being focused on retail. Yeah. Got to become more mixed use, haven't they, in some way, shape, or form? Yeah, and that that was that was a, another moment for me. Yeah, where I was like, okay, we need a product that can potentially go into shopping centers, high streets, redundant office blocks at that time didn't yeah. quite realize what was going to happen to the cen yeah, central office this market. This is slightly pre pandemic. Yeah, so, it was yeah. just on the cusp. And and also perhaps other other um, sectors in the property in the property portfolio in the property world such as tired industrial business parks. Yeah. Um, places that people have typically gone to work at that now are um, built in the 80s, 90s, and perhaps now are not fit for purpose. Yeah. So there was this there was this moment where I thought, well, then we can create a product that would be a physical platform, yes. It would be a brand, yes. But it would be um, very dynamic, and it would be able to go into a shopping center, an office block, a business park, an industrial estate, and curate, reimagine, curate the space. And what was really interesting for me was the locations. Yeah. It was the it was the geography of it. It was the fact that we were going and looking at space in Eastbourne. Yeah. And people were saying to me, Eastbourne, why Eastbourne? And <laughs> I would say, What the hell are you going there? And from? I would say, Well, why not? You know? Yeah. And and everyone said, Well, Brighton's where it's at. And you think, Well, no, Brighton's great, Brighton's fantastic, Brighton's got yeah. 
great operators in it. It's yeah. got... It's reinvented itself. It's done that regeneration piece. It's been it? there and done it. Yeah. And in many ways, people are leaving. Yeah. You know, as, as, as people, people move down to the coast, they move across the coast. And, and we saw that that was expedited by the pandemic. Yeah. So Eastbourne was really interesting. And the average age in Eastbourne, believe it or not, is actually 44 not 84 <laughs> much behind Eastbourne yeah. yeah has got a younger generation profile than we'd get yeah so Brighton's 38 Eastbourne's 40, 44 same as Paul actually okay so um, really really interesting town very aspirational yeah um, legal in general um, investment management real assets own and operate the Beacon which is former Arndale in the okay. centre of Eastbourne um, recently extended and refurbished beautiful shopping centre with enormous footfall yeah absolutely enormous footfall it's got a really good retail mix in it um and through the process of uh, lng's what they call the retail blueprint which is the future ready blueprint for their retail assets which yeah. is effectively headed up by a guy called denz ibrahim denizia ibrahim who's a very very smart lad um and denz is out there now across the entire retail portfolio at lng reimagining and, and effectively repurposing yeah. the centers um, and, and taking them away from being focused on retail, 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 you know, becoming places where you work, live and shop. Wow. So really interesting time, really interesting meeting of minds, I yeah. suppose. You've got a right time, right place for you by the sound of it. Yeah. You, you know, you love this creation piece, but actually needed the investment and the, I suppose, access to assets to do it within. Yeah. And you've got a super talented management team. Yeah. Uh, you've got this these incredible bunch of people uh, at, um, at, real, at Legal and General Real Assets. Um, head of Real Assets is, is incredibly entrepreneurial and, and, uh, and his team is, is, is absolutely fantastic. So you know, as co-founders, they are, they are, they are amazing. Mm -hmm. um, yes, they have a, a, a pretty impressive portfolio across the country, uh, across Europe and across the country. Um, and yes, um, as patient capital investors, they are a, a fantastic um, business partner. But I think for us, we are aligned on the vision, the, the, the plan for founders that we go to places that we can go with genuine purpose mm -hmm. and have impact. Yeah, definitely. That's why we chose Eastbourne, not Brighton. Yeah. LNG do own a lot of assets in Brighton. Yeah. Um, Foundry is an exclusive LNG product. You'll only ever see foundries in legal and general assets. Okay. Um, LNG own other assets in Dorset. Yeah. In other big towns in Dorset. Um, <laughs> um, the big brother of Paul. We won't mention. We won't mention <laughs> Bournemouth. Um, but again, we chose Paul yeah. because because it's back in the underdogs. Because where we could go with real impact. Yeah. And and show and and. With purpose, because it is re so now it's kind of repurposing, it's creating, it's creating these you know flexible spaces, um, but it is a lot to do with regeneration. Then it is, and it, does that excite you? I mean, because that's probably not something that was in your kind of business mix pre the tie up with LNG, was it? I suppose. I suppose regeneration. I've always been uh, with the with the crate hat on. It was working closely with regeneration teams at local authorities because yeah, okay. it was seen as a regeneration tool. You, yeah. You'd go in and you would support the regeneration of that area, you'd that create community. Some vibrance, some, yeah, yeah. You, you, you utilitation of that space. You'd be an early mover, yeah, um, along with lots of resi developers yeah. and you know big, big resi developers. Um, but yeah, that's really exciting. So pool for us is is really exciting because we, our foundry in pool is 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 right in the town centre. It's above the bus station, which historically has had its own challenges. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a regeneration play. It's a repurposing play. Um, and it's effectively going to create opportunities for about 250 nomadic entrepreneurs, yeah. co-workers, untethered corporate employees. It's going to create a platform for people in Paul Town Centre that I suspect, and what we're learning at the moment, is that most of... Our prospect members for Paul are currently leaving Paul each day and driving to Dorchester, Bournemouth, Bristol. All right. Or getting on the train to London. Wow. So what's really interesting for us here is that historically, pre-pandemic, there was a huge outflow from Paul that we identified. Um, 
And I think the pandemic has slowed that outflow, clearly. Yeah. Um, pool is a fantastic place to live and to base yourself and to bring yeah. a family up. And I think the thing that it's lacked in the town centre is, is fit for purpose workspace at scale. Um, that's the reason we did it there. Brilliant. Fantastic. And I've got to ask you, how are you finding, how have you adapted? Because everything to a degree you've done, you know, definitely the gaming piece, you were kind of in control, you were driving it. The create piece, you had investors, but by the sounds of it, you were driving that. Now you're into a relationship with a very large corporate and then G, and by the sounds of it, a very entrepreneurial management team within them that you're working with. But have you had to change your style of entrepreneurship, your style of delivery? Have you had to learn and develop new skills to be to play into play in that world? I suppose. I think so. I think it would be it would be foolish of me to expect that I could just rock up and be this yeah. sort of you know hyper entrepreneurial yeah. chappy. You know, I think the the, the key is is the key is that we're aligned on what we're trying to do with, with okay. the business. So purpose is there. Purpose is really, really important. It's, it's absolutely number one. It's our North Star. Yeah. Why are we doing this? And if we look at a project together, we look at feasibility study on a project, the the underlying factor in all of this is that effectively the the, the investor here is a pensioner. Yeah. So is this the right thing to do? Ask yourself that. Okay, so there are, is there a consistent solid return to be made? And it's important because there's always a, there's always a wider value add yeah. play, whether it's social value add, yeah. which is obviously a huge part of what we're doing. Yeah. There's a there is a there's a natural byproduct of what we do, which has a, 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 a so a, an immediate social value add to the local community where we are. Um, there's the financial and the commercial returns from from what we do, which is obviously very very important because the underlying investor is a pensioner. Yeah. So it's having balance. It's approaching everything with balance. Yeah. I've had to learn new skills naturally. Um, when you're when you're uh, dealing with people who are as talented uh, as the management team that I work with at Legal in general, um, I think sometimes you, you you have to you have to be honest with yourself and you have to put your hand up and say, I "Don't you really understand what you're saying, guys? Can you just yeah. explain that to me?" You know, and I think you get more respect for Definitely. doing that. I think that's really important. Everyone has their strengths and weaknesses. Yeah. I think that's what makes this relationship quite interesting. Brilliant. Because uh, by the sound of it, it's completely complementary, isn't it? And if, and if you've got that open mindedness, which we all need, don't we? That kind of growth mindset to say, actually, I'm going into something new. I've had this success, but I want to learn and I want to develop and I want to become better myself yeah. through these experiences. That's how success and we, how we grow as, grow as individuals, isn't it? So do you describe yourself as a risk taker, Adam? Mm. Uh, and has your profile on risk, your personal attitude to risk, changed over the years? I am an eternal optimist, and I always will be. I <laughs> think that my my risk profile um, is still very much around. Uh, it comes back to it comes back to what we just spoke about. Would you do it if it was your own money? Yeah. You know, frankly, and I think you have to ask yourself that. Definitely. Um, the notion of build it and they will come is it, that's not a business plan. No. You know, um, maybe a twenty-year-old Adam might have might have put that on the side <laughs> of a building. Yeah. Um, but you wouldn't see that in a foundry. No. Um, you know, these are calculated decisions. These are feasibility studies that are well researched, and I think that's been a huge part of my personal progression as well and, and development is being able to being able to um being able to think clearly and make decisions that that are that we believe in and yeah. again it comes back to the purpose comes back to the north star is it the right thing to yeah. do is it the right thing to do brilliant fantastic so where next for the foundry then so you've got eastbourne paul i saw on the website walthamstow um opening soon you know is it to grow indefinitely, you know, what are the plans for the foundry? Sure. Um, again, to go to places, towns and cities, suburban capitals, um, places that have been typically underserved or underinvested, perhaps, that are going through a renaissance. Identify those those assets, those towns, uh, those places, those communities, and deliver 
the right foundry product in that in that space in that environment and curate mm-hmm. the right mix there's not a number on it it's a relatively fast growing business at the moment i don't think we want to hyper grow i don't think that's the model at all mm. i think the model for us is to is to identify the right opportunities um there is a degree of of um uh, when you go to, to to these towns um that provincial towns or you know i mean it's a terrible term used in retail's tertiary right. uh it's a bloody awful term derogatory yeah it's it? a terrible terrible term drop that um um, it's really, really important that, that, that we get under the skin. Yeah. We understand what's going on. And I always talk about the product, our brand, Foundry, that when we go to a town, we should be three, three very clear things, and that's local, yeah. relatable, and aspirational. Really, really simple. Fantastic. We need to be not cookie cutter. We need to be local. We need to be talking like we're from the town. Every foundry, yes, there's a shared brand, there's yeah. a master brand, but every foundry is very different. It's not a cookie cutter rollout. That's, I was going to just about to use that that term because I think one of the challenges, isn't it? And what I love about you know we've only met today, but you know in our pre conversation and during the course of this conversation is that you're really passionate about creating the right thing for the right place in the right town, using that space in a flexible way. You know, not just it being a co-working space, but, you know, it can be this kind of venue event space. It can bring in kind of retail, whatever that needs for that building. But that is going to constrain growth, isn't it? Because the only way to get hyper growth when whatever you do is to have a business model that is a cookie cutter and and, and to replicate and replicate and replicate. And and your, your passion, I can see and hear, is something slightly different. You know, growth is important, but doing it, in the right way with the right principles sounds completely to be where you're at. Brings it back to being relatable. It must be relatable to the town. Yeah. People of the town, the community must feel that they can go there, whatever stage of life you're at, whatever sector you're in. And aspirational, the flip side of that is the aspirational piece. Paul is a very aspirational town yeah. full of super aspirational people. And I always find it quite disappointing when you don't find that 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 level that reflected in the place itself you know so hence being aspirational when we go to a place and responding to those aspirations fantastic right as we wrap up our conversation we've got a few quick questions i'm interested to learn you know family is something that's really important to you adam and therefore how is being entrepreneurial you know starting a number of different businesses over the years affected you and your family tough like i'm sure yeah anyone or you know running your own business. Not easy, is it, to get that balance? It is really tough. Um, 18, 19 wasn't really a problem (laughs) Um, at all. Um, And I could do the hours and I could do what I'm doing now, no problem. I think big lesson for me was my dad. And, you know, losing Kevin was was difficult, unexpectedly. But watching my father on his own entrepreneurial journey was, was a lot to do with a lot to do with where we are today. And I realized quite quickly when we were building these spaces and curating these spaces, I could see that something was going on within me, something had been ignited in me. And it was, it came back to me a year or so after opening Crate. And it was, it was the fact that we'd created 40 odd spaces for businesses and then curated the businesses that were in them, the occupier, the member, the crater, as we called them then, Big impact, I think, was the thing. And um, cringe now, I suppose. But <laughs> but um, but then I started to think, you know, as a kid, my dad ran a construction company that I worked for, got my trade, and I said I left school. And he employed about 160, 170 people. And he ran that business from our garden shed. Yeah. And it was not good. It was not a great environment to grow up in. You know, I think we look back, we had good times. Yeah. We had some really desperate times as well. And I watched my mum and dad really struggle, mm-hmm. really, really struggle financially, ups, downs. Um, my parents lost their home, you know, back then. Wow. Banks would take your house, you yeah. know. Um, and my mum would, on a Thursday, go to NatWest and pick up an insane amount of cash because in 1988, there was no backs payments or check, check, yeah. checks. There was a wage run to be fulfilled. There was wage runs <laughs> and it was little brown envelopes and me and my little sister stamping them with the hours worked, <laughs> you know, nine hours, Monday to Saturday or whatever. 
And yeah, and it was the screaming matches at night with my mum and dad because yeah. cash flow, you know, when you're employing that many people and Absolutely. it's very, very difficult. And I, I witnessed that. And I also witnessed them not having anyone to turn to. They were trying to run there. They were, they were the solo entrepreneurs. They were isolated entrepreneurs in a garden shed that saw their accountant once a quarter. Yeah. And I realized that what we could do was create these spaces and curate these spaces where my dad, 20 years later... Yeah. My dad could have been in that space, in one of those crates, in one of those offices in the foundry, in the foundry's members' lounge, and be able to easily knock on Warren's door and say, hey, Warren, I need a bit of advice. Need a bit of help. Yeah. Need a bit of HR advice. Need a bit of support on growth. And, yeah. and I've got cash flow problems. Whatever it is. Yeah. And I can see that my dad just didn't have that. Yeah. He didn't have that. And he ran that business for a very long time at that scale. Right. And sadly, it did cost my dad his mental health. Wow. Um, and he's sort of rebuilding his life still um, in his late 60s. So, you know, I've, I've seen it. Um, I've, see, I've seen it and, and you know, it's, it was tough. It was really tough to witness. Yeah. Um, and you really, I suppose, as a result, therefore conscious about your own family and the impact of you being entrepreneurial on them, I assume. Of course. And now we're growing this business, which the geography of growing foundry is that I'm everywhere. It's all over the UK. It's it? all over the UK. So yeah, it's a difficult, difficult balance yeah. at the moment, which one that I'll have to, I'll have to try and master. Yeah. Good luck with that. Um, I would also like to ask you now, you know, I think you said earlier age 42 now, yeah. Adam. Yeah. You know, if you look back and you just, you know, opposite you, you had your 19 old, 19 year old version of you. What advice would you give that 19 year old? Ooh. Um, not everyone is a mind reader, Adam. Communicate better. Yeah. Um, I think the team that we're building at Foundry is really interesting because it actually is predominantly female management team. Okay. That's really interesting. So they're really interesting to, to hear their take on me. Yeah. You know, um, I, what would I say? I would probably say... Just remain curious and don't ever be afraid to put your hand up and ask silly questions. Brilliant. Because you get more respect for doing that than trying to bluff or blag your way through something. Yeah. Bullshit doesn't baffle brains. Absolutely does right. Not. Absolutely doesn't, right. It doesn't. I you think that, being curious, I love that. That, that, would, be, that would be it. Be, remain curious. That would be great costs. advice to any youngster, wouldn't it? Be curious. Remain curious. So, always end with one very fundamental question. In terms of success... What's your personal definition of success, Adam? I think I've grown to realise that material things are completely irrelevant. And, you know, I'm sure love nice things. But um, I think it's really important that, as I've learned with my, with my own family, is that, is that health is wealth. Yeah. And I think you know, we've got to keep that Brilliant. forefront of our minds. Fantastic. If people want to learn more about you, Adam, they want to learn more about the foundry, they want to get involved, you know, with what you're doing down here in Paul, or if they're listening elsewhere, Eastbourne, Walthamstow, wherever's next for the foundry, where can they go? Just jump straight onto LinkedIn, Adam Walker Foundry, you'll find me, um, and uh, onto the website, uh, register your interest on the website, and they'll get straight to me. So, Adam, I've Thank loved you. having you as a guest on the Evolve to Succeed podcast thank you for your openness thank you for your honesty it's great to hear what you're doing down here in pool good luck as you open thank you warren it's a pleasure thank you for listening to the evolve to succeed podcast my hope with every episode is that you've learned something new or heard something that challenged your way of thinking and further motivated you on your path towards becoming a more knowledgeable informed and inspired individual and business leader If you enjoyed this episode, then please help us by rating, reviewing and subscribing. We really value your feedback and would love to have you along for future episodes. And please don't forget to learn more about Evolve by going to evolvemembers.com. Thank you for listening. See you next week.